Y'all, fall is falling, spooktober is upon us, and it is time for me to talk about some of my favorite horror books ever. Hi, hello, and welcome back to my channel. My name is Alex, and today we are talking about my top 10 favorite paranormal books. So we're going to get into my favorite paranormal horror books, which paranormal is probably my favorite horror genre just hits the spot you know what i mean it was really hard for me to narrow it down to top 10 and these are all like highly rated books that i've read so i'm going to start with 10 and work my way all the way up to number one now keep in mind like these are all high rated from me so like even though we're starting with 10 is like the lowest of the list there's still books that I really liked. Like, I at least rated them four stars or higher. This is all 100% my personal opinion, my personal thoughts, my personal preferences. So there's there may be books on here that you read that you're like, I did not care for that book. And there's probably books on here that I have not read. Uh, I don't really get into classics that much. I don't get into the old school horror. Uh, I just always feel like I'm kind of not reading what everyone else is reading. I don't know. So maybe because, you know, I don't tend to read what everyone else reads for whatever reason. <laughs> maybe there's some books on this list that you have never heard of that sound appealing to you. Let's get into it. Coming in at number 10 is White Smoke by Tiffany Jackson. Okay, this came out last year. It was the first Tiffany Jackson book that I ever read and it was her first horror novel. I've talked about Tiffany Jackson on my channel before um, because I do have a bit of a gripe with some of her books, but um, let's talk about this one. So this book settles around a young teen girl that um, uh, her family like relocates to this super small, kind of strange town that's like partially dying, I guess you would say, like lots of empty houses, things like that, just like this weird vibe happening in this town. A large part of the reason they moved there is because this young girl is having like some severe anxiety and things like that that have sort of kind of ruined the family's life. So like I'm not going to say everyone's resentful but everyone's a little bit resentful. So they end up moving to this little town and just right off the house is just bad vibes, right? Lots of haunted feels and things like that. and. It's basically like a haunted house book. Tiffany Jackson always does such a good job like writing characters, writing mental health stuff, writing about um, important POC issues. A lot of that is in this book. The representation here was so very good. The atmosphere, I think she nailed it. And I was just, I was so disappointed with the ending. And this is not the first time this has happened with me with the Tiffany Jackson book, okay? So I'm starting to think that this is just like how she writes. Uh, the ending was not very satisfying for me, but lots of good horror vibes, lots of good creep factor, and then the representation like really worked for me. Like if the ending had been any other way, I think this would have definitely made it higher up on the list, but I really hope that she continues to write horror because she writes quite a bit of psychological thrillers, I would say, and she always talks about like really hard hitting issues in the POC community. So I really would love to see more horror from her, but we'll see. But yeah, this is coming in solid number 10. I really did like this book. Number nine, Disappearance at Devil's Rock by Paul Tremblay. Paul Tremblay appears again in this list. If you have not read Paul Tremblay for horror, I highly recommend. I, I think he does a fantastic job. This one hit lower on the list because it just, it didn't completely work for me the way some of his other books did. So basically, kid gets lost in the forest, ends up dead, and the spot that he ends up dead at is like cursed area. Devil's Rock is like cursed. I can't remember if he's dead or if he just disappears. Probably disappears because it's called Disappearance. Wow. The horror in this book, it was not as good as some of his other stuff, okay? 
but this definitely was just like creepy like coming from the other side of the veil there were just some really great moments when I was like whoa but those moments were few and far between so I've seen better work from him in other books but if you like that whole vibe this book was a vibe like the atmosphere that he was able to bring to this book aces okay but the the spook factor the horror factor for me it was a little bit lacking but still great book number eight the graveyard apartment by mariko koiki i didn't say it right i know i didn't i'm very sorry so this book was originally written in Japanese, I think in the 80s, and it was um, translated to English. So just like Envision, Japanese horror, folklore kind of stuff that has then been translated um, to English. It's still set in Japan, and um, it just has all the vibes, okay? Just the perfect setup, the quintessential horror book, okay, is how this setup works for me. This family moves into this apartment building that's overlooking a graveyard. It's super cheap because people don't want to live next to a graveyard because it's bad vibes and everything. And they move in and immediately things start happening. All right. And everything is kind of culminating from the basement. And at some point they decide they have to go to the basement. It was giving very grudge vibes. Okay. Like... I was just freaked out this whole book. It was just a masterpiece, really. Like, and it was super short, and the pace was just phenomenal. You could just fly through this book. And the ending, wow. <sighs> now that I'm thinking back on it, I'm like, why didn't they put it higher on the list? Because the books are just going to get better from here, okay? Like, all these books are good, okay? But this one was like, this was just... Everything you kind of want in a paranormal horror book, this has. It has it. It has it all. And the setting was great. I think the pace was great. Visually, like, you're not going to go wrong with this one. Okay. Coming in at number seven, Mary the Summoning by Hilary Monaghan. This is a series. I did not continue this series just because... Um, I forgot to, <laughs> I forgot to keep reading them. <laughs> I've told you all how much trouble I have with series and like, I, I really do. I have an issue. This book, um, it actually kind of works for me as a standalone. Like, yeah, it did end on a little bit of a cliffhanger, but not enough that I was like, I have to know what happens. Like it ended fairly well. This is considered YA horror. So, you know, the, uh, folklore of Bloody Mary, you know, stand in front of the mirror, you chant her name, and she appears. i um, pretty sure we all played this game in middle school. Like, I 100% believe we all did. So, this book is based off of that. So, just right away, nostalgia, okay? But what happens is one of the girls actually wants Mary to come through the glass, and so it all just starts to like unravel. And of course, like these are teen girls, so their prefrontal cortex is not fully like developed. So they're not making like the, the best decisions. It's just kind of like fly by the seat of our pants and we'll make it work. If there was a theme to this book, it was we'll make it work. Okay, we'll make it work. And I'm sorry, where were the parents during this book? Because they were not there. Stranger Things kind of um vibes about it because it was like everyone just kind of like let their kids do whatever they wanted now i'm pretty sure it's set in recent times like i'm pretty sure it's set in the 2000s which made it even more funny because i feel like there's no way that these parents would not know what their kids were up to but if you like that ghost story that folklore um this also this had very like heavy ring vibes like the coming out of the tv type vibes like I really enjoyed this and like I said I don't really love YA horror because I feel like it's just really toned down a little bit but this really worked for me like and it was easy it was an easy read like they're not complicated at all the concepts were really good 
the writing was very detailed so that you could really feel like you were in it. So I really enjoyed this one. Number six, The Demonologist by Andrew Piper. This is the first horror book I read as an adult. I read horror when I was younger, um, but at some point I just stopped reading it. This was the first book I remember picking up as a fully grown adult and reading and like getting just scared. <laughs> this book is what helped me get back into horror. Like I remember thinking, man, I really miss horror. And so this book, like it always has a special place in my heart. The story is, um, our main character, I can't remember his name now, but, um, he's one of those people that goes and like documents strange paranormal happenings and like tries to prove them wrong. I forget what this is called. It's like a legitimate term. He's one of those people and he gets, he gets this assignment in Venice, takes his young daughter with him because he's a single dad. And, um, while he's in Venice investigating this paranormal happening, his daughter disappears from this realm into another one. And it becomes his job to find the demon that took her and get her back. I mean, setting Venice, wonderful. The paranormal aspect of it, I remember getting scared out of my mind reading this book. Like, the way that Andrew Piper was able to write jump scare. Have you ever been jump scared by a book? incredible talent it takes to get jump scared by a book okay because it's it's words like you're building it up in your head and he pulled it off like it was so well done it really gave me if Robert Langston was a demon hunter that's what it was giving for me and then on top of that um just the paranormal writing was very good I'm so glad I came across this book. Like, I'm glad I came across it. I'm glad I read it. And I'm glad that it reopened the door for me for horror. So if you're wanting something like a little bit different, because it does have this like kind of um, mystery solving vibe to it on top of the paranormal writing. So it's very fun. Like, I couldn't put it down. Check this one out, okay? Number five, y'all, we're halfway through, is The Silent Companions by Laura Purcell. I read this one last year for October, and I just remember thinking I was going to hate it, and it really worked. Because, okay, first off, it's a period piece. I don't really read period pieces. I think this is a Victorian-era horror story. So, um, Haunted House, Victorian-era, uh, really not my vibe. <laughs> It was so well written, could not put it down. It just scared the crap out of me. Like, the little moments of this book just burrowed into my brain. I still think about this book all the time. Sometimes when I have trouble sleeping, I think about this book. <laughs> Haunted House, Victorian era. This woman is pregnant and her husband buys this mansion. And he dies before they even get out there. So she gets out there and now she's like, oh, I'm about to have this baby in a haunted house without my husband with this like huge wait staff of people that don't want to be there because they think the house is cursed. She finds this locked room under the stairs full of wooden lifelike statues of people. And one of them looks just like her. And then she notices that they're like, following her. So that's kind of like the whole basis of the book. Now we're getting higher up on the list. I am going to say this. If you are one of those people that have a very visual imagination, like you can read something and immediately the picture pops into your head, these books are gonna be for you, okay? I'm one of those people. If the writer is good at sounds, at smells, I'm going to be in it and I'm going to be really freaked out. Okay. So if you have a very visual imagination where you can put these words like literally to life in your head, these books are really going to work for you because that's exactly how I am. The little moments in this book worked and it ended up that the house has a really complicated history. And so if you like the history of haunted houses, 
you like the paranormal writing and you have a visual imagination, yes, this book. And the ending, the ending of this book. Wow. Number four, The Only Good Indians by Stephen Graham Jones. I did not even know if I should put this on this list or if it should go on next week's list because I don't technically know if this is paranormal writing. It's more like indigenous folklore, but to me, I feel like folklore is paranormal. So you know what? It went on because this, this book just like, it blew me away. I did not know what I was expecting going into this book. And let me tell you, I had to sit with this book for a week before I was like, okay, I can talk about it. If you like gore writing, ladies and gentlemen, here she is, okay? Okay, I can talk about it now. <laughs> this is an indigenous horror book. So um, the main characters were all boys when the um, story starts and they go on this elk hunting trip and something happens. When you flash forward, like, I think it's 20 years um, into the future, maybe 10, and um, they've all kind of, like, gone their separate ways, but all of a sudden, all of these weird things start happening um, to each of them, and they each start slowly dying and being hunted by something that they unearthed during this um, elk hunting trip. I really had to go back and reread a couple places because I felt like I was missing what was happening. Um, you really just have to like open your mind a little bit. It's, it's folklore, so I don't feel like it always has to make complete sense. But once I sat with it for a little bit, it really came full circle for me and I was like, okay, I get it. But I did have to sit with it a minute. So if you read it and then you find yourself like really confused at the end, or like it just didn't make any sense, sit with it for a little bit. I, um, yeah, just sit with it for a little bit. Now, the storyline, wow. The pace, it was a little slow at the beginning, but it made up for it in abundance later because it was just high octane, just creepy, scary, could not read it fast enough like yeah so the the beginning is a little bit slow but man it just picks off and you're off okay the gore writing incredible stephen graham jones you have my heart for writing this book <laughs> the gore writing i uh for me really really worked um this is one of my top gore books and that's why I almost didn't put it on this list because this is the paranormal list. But because it's indigenous folklore, I felt like I had to put it in there. Seriously, read this book. You don't know what you're missing if you have not read it. I feel like a lot of people have been reading it though um, because it's getting a lot of buzz. If you haven't read it, you need to, okay? Trust me. Number three, My Best Friend's Exorcism by Grady Hendrix. This is my first Grady Hendrix book, okay? And I read it a couple years ago. And let me just say, after I read this one, and then I read more Grady Hendrix book, I still pull back to this one. This has got to be my favorite Grady Hendrix book because he did it so well. There were so many little pieces in here that just twisted my gut, okay? There were just so many little moments that were so brilliant, okay, that when I've read some of his other stuff, I'm like, he just didn't have the finesse in his other books that he had for this book. So if you're kind of like in between Grady Hendrix books, like you don't know which one to read, I recommend this one because it's my absolute favorite of his that I've ever read. Nostalgia galore, okay? I feel like Grady Hendrix's books always have the nostalgia factor, and I absolutely love him for that because I love nostalgic writing. And nostalgic writing and paranormal horror? Oh, come on. You cannot go wrong. So this is set, like, I think it's in the 80s, and a couple girls in high school, like, one of them gets uh, slowly taken over by an entity. 
and it's so slow and so gradual that it's almost like it's not happening. It's almost like you're being gaslit into thinking it's not real. It's that, it, it yeah. <laughs> you're being gaslit into thinking it's not, it's not happening. And then like you can't deny that it's happening. And then it's almost too late to fix it. It's just like a roller coaster of emotions. Grady Hendrix is an excellent gore writer. There are so many disgusting moments in this book that just made me feel queasy, made me feel sick to my stomach. There are some really great moments in this book where you're just like, that's disgusting. If you have a very visual imagination, these books will work for you. It put me so in the moment and there was just there was one moment in this book if you've read it I will never forgive Grady Hendrix for doing this to me there is a moment in this book if you do not like animal horror don't read it save yourself a moment I have such a beef with Grady Hendrix about this moment in this book that I have literally told everybody in the other books of his I read like if he does that shit again in this book I'm not reading it I'm putting it down. Broke my heart, okay? The one thing I really do like about this book is Grady Hendrix took a lot of care in what happened after everything was over. At the end of the book, he put a lot of time and effort into the epilogue, and I really appreciated that. Um, he never leaves you hanging. Grady Hendrix really gives you tons of closure at the end of the book, and I, I really appreciate that, especially in horror, because I feel like, you know, you just want to get to the high moments and then the, the book's over. He puts a lot into the epilogue, so yeah. My best friend's exorcism. Like, it's good. It's good. Okay, we are coming down to the final two. And let me tell you, I had the biggest internal struggle figuring out which one was going to be number two and which one was going to be number one of my favorite paranormal horror books, okay? At number two, A Head Full of Ghosts by Paul Tremblay. If you've read this book, you know, okay? Paul Tremblay, he was giving me the runaround, okay? Giving me the runaround. I thought the whole time, got it figured out. Got it figured out. No, you didn't. The premise of this book is so interesting to me and just twisted. It's basically like two separate stories going, stories going on. The bulk of the story is about a young girl whose sister gets possessed or they believe that she's possessed and um the family hires an exorcism um to happen at the same time a film crew comes into their home to document the exorcism okay so that right there is like a whole thing you've got these people in there trying to exorcise a demon out of a teenage girl and then you've got a TV crew there trying to do like a Ghost Hunters episode of this happening. Like a documentary film crew is there trying to capture these moments. And all of these memories are coming from the sister of the girl that's possessed. So it's like, I think she's like seven. So this is all coming from like a seven-year-old's memory, right? Okay, so that's the bulk of the story. The other part of the story is about a girl that is writing a blog about the documentary and like picking it apart and trying to prove that it wasn't real. So we're getting two types of stories at the same time. And in, you're just like, you don't know what to believe. You don't know what to believe. And I still don't. After reading this book, I still do not know what I believe about this book. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. And that's brilliant. That's brilliant that I read this book so long ago and I still constantly think about it. I still think about the ending of this book. The ending of this book was brilliant, okay? You could not have asked for a more twisted ending than what happened at the end of this book. Every time I think about this book, every time I talk about this book, just read it. If you've not read it. It will blow your mind. This was the first Paul Tremblay book that I read. 
and I'm so mad it was the first one because it set the bar so incredibly high for him. He has never topped this book. I have read, I think, five of his books now. He has never topped this one. This book, brilliant. If you like paranormal writing, if you like that whole documentary vibe about it, and it's almost like psychological horror too. Paranormal and psychological horror in this book. Like, he outdid himself. This is his best book. Until I read another one of his books that is better than this, no, this is his best book for me out of the ones that I have read. This is the, this is the book that I, I almost hold all of my paranormal standards to. This is my number one. If it's not better than this book, it's not the best. Now, let me, as I say that, we're going to talk about my, my favorite one. Read this book if you haven't read it. Just, and if you have read it, read it again. Come on, you know you want to read it again. Okay, number one. Number one is here. It is going to be hard for any book to top this one. Just because the ending of this book was brilliant. I feel like I'm saying that word too many times. Okay. Hex. Thomas Old Cuvel. If you've read this book, you know. You know how good it is. If you have not read this book, please, if you like paranormal writing, haunted, witches, curses, anything like that, this book. So we're in this town where they have a real life witch that died a long time ago. They had to sew her mouth shut so that she could not put curses on anyone and they sewed her eyes shut. So she's like this century old witch with sewed shut eyes and a sewed shut mouth wandering around this town and she just like comes in and out of people's homes and she's just kind of like, at first you're like, oh, well she's just kind of like a fixture of the neighborhood. Some kitschy kind of weird thing that happens in this town. Well, as we get further into the book, we start to learn more about like the history of the town and the history of like her and what's happened to the people that interacted with her before they like tried to kill her and why her mouth had to be sewn shut. Like further into the book, we start to realize that like the town itself is cursed as well. It's not just the witch. It's not just, you know, some story. Like there's a lot of undercurrent in this town that is tied directly to this woman that's been dead for a long time. At some point in the book, some young little teen boys decide it might be fun to mess with her maybe cut a few stitches off her mouth so she, we can hear what she's trying to say, hear what she's trying to whisper. If your visual imagination can run wild, this book will work for you. It's a lot of little moments, a little WTF moments that will just crawl into your brain and live there forever. I remember when I first read this book, I was living in a house where my laundry room was in my basement and the room that my laundry room was had no windows and it was like the darkest room in the whole house and I remember I went down there and I opened the door to the laundry room and I immediately panicked because I felt like something was in there with me. This book lives rent free in my head. like. Thomas Oldfield did such a good job, such a good job writing this book. In the last couple of pages of the book, wow, just wow. I I really loved this book. Now, the most one of the most interesting things about this book, it was originally written in another language. Um, I can't remember now if it's Swedish or Finnish. It was originally written in that because um, that is. Thomas's um, mother language. So he originally wrote the book in another language and this was translated. But in the original version, he wrote a different ending. He wrote a different ending. 
And he said in the follow-up for this book that he purposely changed the ending in the English version because he wanted to see which one people liked better. Excuse me, sir, but a lot of us don't read the other language that you wrote this book in. So there is a part of me that wants to get a hold of that other book in whatever language it's written in so that I can read the ending because I want to know what other ending he cooked up because the ending for this one was so good. I still haven't done it. I still haven't tried to track down this book in its original language and um, it's still a lifelong goal of mine <laughs> to find the original language written hex book and read the ending. It's like this book and the Paul Tremblay book are the gold standard for my paranormal readings because this this book deals with like um curses and witches in a very physical sense like the witch is there in the um paul tremblay book really deals with the unseen paranormal like you know it's an exorcism book basically so it's unseen paranormal stuff they are two sides of the same coin okay and these two books hold the gold standard in my heart for paranormal horror um and I read these long ago, and they still hold a special place in my heart. That is my top 10 favorite paranormal horror books. I really hope you guys enjoyed this episode. October is honestly my favorite time of year. I only read horror in October, and it's just, I love horror books, but I don't have the psyche or the stomach to read it all year, so I just binge it in October. <laughs> Yeah, I've already started on my horror books for this month. The first one was kind of a bust, which was really hard because if you watched my September wrap-up, you'll know September was a really difficult month for me. I didn't have a lot of good books that I enjoyed, so uh, to read a not-so-great book right off the bat in October really just has slowed my momentum to a crawl, okay? I'm digging myself out with the book I'm reading now because it's freaking me out. It's writing's very good. So I'm getting excited again. I'm getting back up on my feet. I'm going to get my momentum up again, but I'm really excited about my October reads. Next week, I'm talking more about horror books, and this is going to be more like generalized horror and science fiction horror, which is another one that I tend to read a lot. Um, so yeah, next week, general horror, science fiction horror, some of my favorite books going to be great. Lots of gore writing in that too. I'm excited. Make sure you hit all the buttons down below so you know when I'm posting. I post every week. Let me know in the comments if you read any of the books on my top 10 paranormal horror reading recommendation list. Um, let me know if there's some books that you think should be on my top 10 list. And I will see you guys next time. Bye!